Research is the watchword today for solutions to serious problems, social, political, technological. Breakthrough has already shown how important research is in educating young men, both undergraduates and graduate students. Research is equally important in the education of young women. These young women, all students at Mount Holyoke College, as they press buttons, flashlights, and diagram reactions, are finding out for themselves the nature of scientific truth and at the same time contributing to the knowledge that will lead to future discoveries. Mount Holyoke College was founded in the village of South Hadley more than 100 years ago by a pioneer, Mary Lyon. She surmounted all sorts of obstacles to guarantee that able young women could get higher education, just as challenging and rigorous as that available to young men. When Mount Holyoke opened in 1837, the student body numbered 80. Today, there are 1,400 undergraduates and 50 graduate students. The faculty itself numbers 150, and the campus now has spread out over 660 acres. But the educational principles remain unchanged. Mount Holyoke is still dedicated to the liberal arts tradition, to the mastery of ideas which must be tested in carefully planned scientific experiment, in artistic composition, in formal statement, in constant discussion. Back in the 1830s, people called Mary Lyon's scheme for college education for women unnatural, unpractical, and unfeminine. Today, skeptics put their doubts differently. They ask, can they do research that really counts at an undergraduate liberal arts college for women? For an answer to that question, let's consult President Richard Glenn Gattell, who has headed Mount Holyoke since 1957, and is himself an economist and expert on operations analysis. We're proud of the great variety and the quality of the projects underway on the campus. The Mount Holyoke faculty has many distinguished scholars who carry a full schedule of classroom teaching and still continue their own special research on the side. Our students are intellectually able young women with alert and curious minds. And our curriculum has been designed to acquaint them with the developments of science, the problems of the social sciences, and the great ideas and the value judgments of the humanities. We hope that every student here will learn how to proceed in depth, to investigate a difficult problem thoroughly by gathering facts, determining their relevance, analyzing them, and interrelating them in order to reach sound and reasoned conclusions. The kind of research that fits into this sort of teaching program has received wide recognition. Just in the last three years, we received over $400,000 in grants for our ac academic programs, and three quarters of it for research projects administered by individual faculty members. Now, these grants from the armed forces, the federal government, educational foundations, and business corporations are one more demonstration of the fact that intelligence has no gender. Professor Thomas W. Reese is chairman of the psychology department and first director of PRU, the psychophysical research unit set up at Mount Holyoke in 1946. Professor Reese, why have the Air Force and the Navy in the past 14 years invested some $300,000 in projects carried out partly by Mount Holyoke undergraduates? Well, Victor, in general, the Air Force and the Navy are interested in problems of visual perception. Uh, these are problems related to things like map reading or interpreting information on a radar screen. And it has known whole classes of problems like this that we have been working on. Our research has been pure research, though, so not applied. As you know, all of our undergraduates are required to do independent work as part of their undergraduate training. They have to do an original experiment, not a rehash of somebody else's, formulate the problem, build the apparatus if necessary, do the necessary statistics, and finally report this at meetings run like a scientific meeting. We try to get across to them that science is not made by a lot of intelligent people uh, sitting around having bright ideas Science is one bright idea, usually, plus a lot of very hard work. We also feel very definitely that the best way to teach science is to make science. The present director, Associate Professor Horace Corbin, calls this experiment finding the needle in the haystack. Susan Stanley, the young woman about to pull the lever, is a senior from Hawaii. 
who has been doing honors work throughout the year on this problem. When the bell sounds, a lot of dots will flash on the screen. The subject, wearing that rubber fingertip, is trying to see how quickly she can spot the one big dot among all the little ones. Here is another experiment designed to find out how people see. Young Bo Kim of Korea is working with Professor Corbin on this project, which is financed by the National Science Foundation. Her subject is trying to distinguish triangles and squares as she flashes those carefully jumbled slides on a screen. In this row of telephone booths built last year on a project for the Navy, everybody's about to start counting. Joan Stevenson of Milton, Massachusetts and Becky Robinson of Reno, Nevada are in charge. They're trying to find out whether people can count more accurately by seeing a flashing light or by hearing a tick or by feeling a beat or whether it helps to see, hear, and feel all at the same time. Student researchers learn to check and recheck every separate result and also to go through the time-consuming process of putting their findings into a form in which they can be used by others. Accurate graphs are particularly important. The findings will belong not only to the Air Force or the Navy, but also to other scientists, beginning or advanced, who want to know more about the way human beings perceive the physical world. In these three PRU publications are summaries of 100 separate experiments, including the names of 70 undergraduates. Experimenters in the psychology department also have a chance to learn the technique of the professional meeting. All of them present reports and demonstrations to a highly critical and articulate audience of their colleagues. In a small liberal arts college where classroom teaching is everyone's first concern, time for research is often a problem. That's why uninterrupted summer vacations are so important to so many members of the faculty. At Mount Holyoke, grants for research have enabled faculty members to include undergraduates in their summer research projects. Professor George Hall of the chemistry department heads a summer crew of nine, including two other faculty members, one graduate assistant and five undergraduates. Down the hall, Professor Lucy Pickett, winner of the Garvin Medal of the American Chemical Society, and assistant professor Beverly Griffin, who already has two PhD degrees in chemistry, have two entirely different projects underway, both subsidized by grants. Money for scientific investigation goes for expensive equipment and materials, as well as assistance. Over at that complicated apparatus with Professor Hall is Elaine Libby of Yarmouth, Maine. We'll ask Elaine to explain that machine. It is a complicated device called an infrared spectrophotometer. It can identify colors that are invisible to the human eye. We're using it now to find out how many molecules in certain compounds contain heavy hydrogen. Foundation grants also support summer research at Mount Holyoke and the other sciences. In the physiology department, Professor Jitta Moos works with an undergraduate assistant, Carolyn Barbaki of Holyoke, on the processes of digestion that are connected with enzymes found in saliva. Downstairs in the zoology laboratory, Professor Catherine Stein has a grant from the National Institutes of Health. Helping her with her colony of mice is Patricia Labine of Summers, Connecticut, who hopes to continue with this study during the coming academic year as an honors project. Professor Stein, many years ago, I had a pair of what they called in those days waltzing mice, and I often wondered what made them go round and round, never stopping, 24 hours a day. Perhaps today you can give me the answer to this deep mystery. We know what makes these dark ones go round. We got these from Oak Ridge Laboratory to see whether they might be searching for the same reason that the white ones are. Um, and we found that these have either a missing semicircular canal or one which is non-functional. This therefore upsets their balance. These, on the other hand, we found were due to a different cause. I was a hard There's time a, keeping him on the table. The yeah, semicircular <laughs> canals are quite normal. We have gone that far in trying to ferret out the mystery of what causes them to circle. Is there any way, we talked about the circling, is there any way to keep these mice uh, on the straight and narrow, so to speak? Not that I know of. <laughs> now, Pat has been working with some of these mice, has she not? Yes, she has, and she could probably tell you a little bit more about the white ones because she hopes to continue working on those in the future. Uh, Pat, what have you found out about the white mice? Well, these white mice, they, they, they arose with a strain within our own laboratory here. Uh, they, they've been a rather interesting problem because there is nothing wrong with their balancing centers in their inner ear. They have perfectly normal semicircular canals. There's another interesting aspect to this problem, too. If you notice that this white mouse has a loop in its tail, 
And the gene that causes this loop in the tail will also cause the, the circling action of the mouse. We want to find out exactly what is this relationship. You know at the present time just what you're going to have to do in this experiment, what actual experimentation is going to take place to try to isolate this phenomenon and find out what this is all about? Well, we have a few probable leads. It's probably something wrong in the brain or in the nervous part of the ear. Well, thank you very much, both of you. Here is Professor Everett Hawkins, chairman of the economics department, to tell us about the recent award from the Ford Foundation to Mount Holyoke and its three near neighbors in the Connecticut Valley, Amherst, Smith, and the University of Massachusetts. I'm happy to talk about $191,000. This grant for a program of non-Western studies over the next three years will help students in all four colleges to know more about Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. It will increase our all-important collection of books and periodicals about these areas. It will enable us to add specialists to our faculties. It will help us bring distinguished visitors like Professor Shigeto Tsuru from Tokyo, Japan to discuss specific problems with our undergraduates. This grant was made partly because the four colleges have been working together on many different kinds of projects, including a joint library, and partly because all four institutions have a long tradition of interest in Asia. At Mount Holyoke, the academic dean, Professor Maribeth Cameron, is an authority on Chinese history. Since 1948, she's been giving a course on the history and civilization of Eastern Asia. The seminars on current problems conducted by the departments of political science and economics have frequently focused on non-Western areas. The political science department has long stressed work in international organization and law. The reading list for a seminar on the Middle East is checked by department assistant Sumiko Wiki of Tokyo. Professor Hawkins, just back from two years in Indonesia, where he taught in the University of Yogyakarta, directs a seminar on Indonesian economic problems. The study of foreign languages, so important to international understanding, now includes a full program in Russian, in which 27 additional hours of work are being added to the curriculum this year. Here, one of the Russian majors, Archer Brown of Larchmont, New York, helps Assistant Professor Vladimir Sakovic with a session in the language laboratory for beginning students. Getting the other fellow's point of view is often a matter of knowing him as a person. At Mount Holyoke, where many of the ablest graduates in the early years lived in the Orient as missionaries, foreign students have always been considered important. Students, faculty, and alumni have raised money for foreign scholarships. This next year, a young woman from Sierra Leone, Africa, will be attending Mount Holyoke on scholarship money won by an undergraduate team in a TV college quiz competition. Among the 33 foreign students at Mount Holyoke, one-third come from non-Western areas. Nguyen Min Chao of South Vietnam has been spreading interest in Eastern ways while she's been learning to live in the Western world. Rasheshwari Hiramat from Bombay is taking political science courses to help her prepare for a career in the foreign service. This is Kazuko Hori, a graduate student in English who is working on the novels of Henry James. Why are you uh, working on the novels of Henry James? Why did you choose uh, that author among all the famous authors in America? Well, uh, what attracted me most in Henry James was that uh, his writing is a work of art, and he is a great artist. Well, this is your second period of study here at Mount Holyoke, isn't it? Yes, I was here as an un undergraduate uh, from 1950 to 52. And I came back this time uh, to do my graduate work. Would you say the Japanese people are interested in studying here in the United States, Kazuko? Oh, yes, very much. When I first came, uh, I came up as a Garyoa student. And at that time, to choose uh, 150, there were over 6,000 who took the examination. Well, I understand you're on leave from a very important job at the American Embassy in Tokyo. Well, I don't know. Uh, it's not that important. It's very interesting. And um, since it involves a great deal of writing, I think my literature study will be a great help. Most of the grants to Mount Holyoke have come from the military services, the government, or privately financed foundations. A few have come from business firms. 
one of the relatively small number of corporations already convinced that investing in liberal education for able young women pays off is the DuPont Corporation. DuPont has given $4,000 a year since 1956 to provide scholarships to summer school for Mount Holyoke students like Gail Moffat of Scarsdale, New York, who wants to teach math or science in high school. A math major, Gail took practical education courses last summer. Next year, she'll be teaching high school mathematics at the Punahou School in Hawaii. Grants are a great source of strength as far as they go, but they're not equally distributed among all the important fields of knowledge. Any would-be investor in fruitful undergraduate research could find golden opportunities among the unsubsidized projects now being carried out in art, music, literature, languages, philosophy, history, and religion. Lee Rumet has combined her interests in French literature and in the theater in an unusual honors project. From her study of the comic spirit and the plays of dramatists like Moliere, she wrote not only a critical paper, but directed two theatrical productions in the laboratory theater. Away. I'm trying to. Dear mother, do not say near me. I pray that thousands will not fear. Do not fear. I have not, nor never will, do anything against my duty. Believe me, dear mother, do. Hold it just a minute. Uh, Sue, on the line, believe me, dear mother, do. Try kneeling in front of her. And then she will raise you up, and then you'll have a complete change of mood and say, Well, mother, if you only knew him better, and you turn left down that. Oh. And she follows you. Oh. Um, uh, you have a mind to know him better. Take that first again. Dear mother, do but stay and hear me. I am betrayed, and thou art and son, I fear. Do not fear it. I have not, nor never will do anything against my duty. Believe me, dear mother, do. If you will but know him better, you have a mind to know him. Lee, in your study of the comic spirit in the theater, are you approaching this from a psychological point of view or from a dramatic? Well, I would be tempted to say dramatic but one cannot study comedy without going a little bit into the psychological so i have studied that too have you any findings because i'm sure you could sell them to some playwrights who want to make the audiences laugh a little more these days well there are no uh universal principles but there are several theories that seem to me quite valid especially the one based on adler's supposition that uh the basic psychological human drive is the drive for superiority. Now, Bergson also su suggests that this is the basis for laughter, that people in the comic theater laugh at the comic characters because at the moment they themselves are not subject to the quirks of chance, whereas the comic characters are, and for that moment they feel superior, and therefore they feel good and they laugh. Are you interested in any particular period of the theater? Well, because of the experience I have had with Moliere and restoration comedy in particular, acting in both and now directing this play that you see in progress, I would say that I know more about those two periods than any other, but I'm interested in all periods. Let's confine ourselves for a moment to the 16th century, Lee. In other words, let's take a play from Moliere and a play of Shakespeare's. Is there a great deal of difference in the humorous and comic approach between those two playwrights? Well, there certainly is, but I don't know quite how to define it in such a short time. Perhaps I could use a, a figure of speech or, or an example from sculpture. For example, Moliere is more like a classical sculpture or a Roman temple as opposed to Shakespeare who is like more Gothic, like a Gothic cathedral. Moliere is more light, crisp, very reasonable. The wit is above the eyebrows. <laughs> is also this play. Perhaps highly sophisticated, too. Yes, very sophisticated, whereas the English, in my opinion, tend more toward the extremes. They either have uh, a very fanciful comedy like Midsummer Night's Dream, or else a, a more uh, broad humor like Falstaff, obviously, and uh, Toby Belch and people like that. When you leave uh, Mount Holyoke, do you intend to go into the professional theater because of all your background and your interest in it? Well, I don't know. Perhaps not professional theater, perhaps just community or college theater. But I know that I'll, it'll always be an allocation with me. I'll always do something in the theater. Another unsponsored project is a series of original illustrations for some lyric poems by a great 20th century German poet, Rilke. Jerry Benedict of Weston, working with sculptor Henry Rocks, started by making her own translations from the German of the Duino Elegies. 
Jerry, why did you choose Rilke as the subject of your illustrations rather than the famous German poet, for example, Goethe? Well, I hadn't thought of Rilke as a German poet when I began reading him and liking him. He's always been a favorite poet that I'd read in translation, and only recently when I've gotten to know German have I thought of him as a specifically German poet. This, of course, meant, uh, naturally enough, you had to do some uh, German studies. Yes, it did. I studied German last year, and then this summer, when I was embarked on the translations, I studied it very intensively, and I think got quite a bit better toward the end of it. How long has this project been going on? Since last spring, I guess, when I first decided on it definitely. Last summer was dealing with the German, and this winter is dealing with the wood. How many woodcuts have you made up to date? Well, I've made seven uh, ones that I've decided to keep, and I've also done two wood engravings. Do you plan to illustrate a book with your engravings and woodcuts when it's all over? I'd like to. Not with these. These aren't suitable, I don't think. But I'd like to do more and continue with the project. I'm still very interested in it, even after a year. All right. Well, thank you very much. Some 70 theses written by members of the class part of their independent research for honors are being added to the permanent collection of the Mount Holyoke Library. Almost half of them deal with literature or history. Elizabeth Topham of Westfield, New Jersey, has been spending a good part of her senior year working on a problem in medieval history. Like Jerry, she looks forward to teaching in college. For the next two years, she'll be studying in England at Oxford University. She is one of two dozen especially gifted U.S. undergraduates to receive the much-coveted Marshall Scholarships given by the British government for Anglo-American mutual assistance. And now I'd like you to meet Elizabeth Topham. Uh, Liz, with so much of today's education being directed to the field of science, physics in particular, and the interest in the world of tomorrow, why are you so interested in the world of yesterday, namely the Middle Ages? Well, I think that a great deal of the world of today, and probably of tomorrow too, can only be understood in, in terms of the world of yesterday. It may seem strange to us at the current point to think of our system of law and many of our system of moral judgments coming directly from the Middle Ages, but I think this is true. You can trace a descent, for example, of the English common law directly from the 10th to the 12th century right into our current constitution and our current system of, of jury trial. In many of the scholars' books on the Middle Ages, you get the impression of unity, of cohesion, of people having their place, everything in its place. In contradistinction to the 20th century, which has been named the Aspirin Age, the Age of Anxiety, the Age of Alienation, people not knowing where they're going, where they've come from. Uh, do you find this true in your studies? No, I don't. I think that perhaps you're oversimplifying the Middle Ages. I think that in this particular system, where you, from, let's say, the 10th to the 13th century, you have just as much, if not more, anxiety than you have currently. You have, for example, at the end of the 10th century, a very real fear that that God is going to destroy the world, that man's sins are going to be visited upon him, and that not only the physical aspects of death, but the very horrible aspects of torture and hell are going to come upon him immediately. And therefore, you find men giving up all their hope in the world and giving up also their real property in the world to appease God and to make a better situation for themselves in hell. Well, three centuries after this, you have the Black Death visited upon men. This, again, to the medieval mind, is God's anger at man. And you find in, in the works of art at this particular period horrible representations of worms eating away human bodies, and even more horrible representations of demons carrying men off into, into flame and fire, a very, very horrible thing, parallel, I think, and even worse than our fear of the nuclear bomb that's made for us now. Why are you doing so much research, considering you're an undergraduate student, Liz? Well, because I'm in history, and because I don't think that history can be learned in terms of classroom experience. You see, history is not really a series of names and dates and events that have gone on in the past, but rather it's a process of mind, which involves being presented with, well, with a certain amount of evidence that has no inherent order in it itself but which you as a historian put your mind to and draw out in order, as I've tried to do in, in the charts here. And as you do this and impose a coherence and a meaning on this evidence, you have history, and that's what history means.
Discovery is the key word for all the research at Mount Holyoke, subsidized and unsubsidized. It's a significant process in growing up. It starts early in life, as this student research project at the Gorse Child Study Center demonstrates. These two four-year-olds are learning, as part of a study in cooperation and sharing, how to make a toy come out of this chute. They must both press the right button at the right time. And the psychology students conducting the experiment out of sight behind the one-way screen, Cynthia Friedman and Jane Lauterbach, are also discovering for themselves something important about human behavior. This is the chymograph on which the cooperative responses are recorded. This is the fourth channel recorder on which each child's cooperative responses are recorded and each child's uncooperative responses are recorded also. We record the cooperatives again so that we can see if one child is trying to cooperate more than the other child. These are the power supplies. This is the shoe, which is manually fed, but with these reinforcements, we have little rings, little guns, little soldiers, and magnifying glasses. This is the light which is attached to the chymographs so that we can tell when to manually feed uh, the reinforcements. This is the holding relay, and this is another holding relay over here. This is an experiment on cooperation and sharing. The children work in pairs. At the moment, they're being instructed by a student experimenter, Cynthia Friedman. The children work in pairs, and if they both press the same button, which in this case is the blue button on the left, a toy will come down the chute. We have been running four-year-old children, five-year-olds, third graders, and sixth graders in this experiment. The grade school children seem to learn almost immediately, and they share equitably. The five-year-olds learn, but it takes them a while. We have had to bring several pairs of five-year-olds back for a second 10-minute session. They, too, tend to share the toys, even Stephen, but the sharing is not as dependable as with the grade school children. This seems, however, to be a situation in which the four-year-olds do not learn to cooperate readily. I think it's probably that the whole situation is too distracting or maybe too exciting for them to be able to concentrate. For most college students, discovery begins in the classroom. Women undergraduates, like men, can go far in research if they have time, equipment, and the right kind of faculty direction. The gifts and grants made to Mount Holyoke for research are helping to whet curiosity and stimulate independent thought. They may have started more than one of these young women on the way toward making a lasting contribution to scientific knowledge or human understanding. After the ceremonies are over, these new graduates will go out into laboratories, classrooms, offices, to homes of their own and to the larger community. Their daily lives will be reflecting the maturity of thought and wisdom and action that are the aims of a liberal education. <laughs>